our mother house, uh, our, our center here in Michigan is just outside of Lowell. Our mother house is in Connecticut. We were just talking back there about that a few minutes ago. Um, I teach at Grand Valley State University. I'm a professor in the writing department at Grand Valley. And um, with the love of our blessed mother. I guess I, I think that's probably all you need to know. Okay? This past March, I had the great privilege of making a pilgrimage to the Sanctuaria of Fatima in this centennial year with my friends Kevin Matthews, with whom I worked on the book Broken Mary, and Father Mark Shibish of St. Anthony Padua, of Padua Parish here in Grand Rapids. The three of us went. We were there not long before our Holy Father, Pope Francis, came on May 13th. We could see them preparing. They were, they were very busily preparing for the Holy Father. And of course, he came to canonize the young shepherds, Francisco and Jacinta Marto. I have to learn how to use this. No, I can do this. Oh, here's our Holy Father oh. in, in Fatima. Okay, now I don't know whether I can do this or not, but I set this up to just show you a very brief minute. Does this have sound? Can you hear this? Francisco Marto de Santa Jacinta. Okay, I'm going to stop it. This is very nice and we could watch it for a while. <laughs> and I need to now, I just probably, how do I get out of this? I mean, do I just Did it escape? was a blessed experience and one for which I am very grateful, particularly to the, the donors who made it possible. We were able to pray at the Capalina, um, which is, if you haven't been to Fatima, it's right here. This is the Chapel of the Apparitions. And at the Basilica, which is behind it, of the Most Holy Rosary. And we were able to pray, this is a beautiful basilica, and we were there for a week, so we spent a lot, and we were just there to pray. So we spent a lot of time. We did one day, we went up to Coimbra, um, because we were invited by um, the Carmelites, where Sister Lucia uh, lived, to come there, and we were able to pray in their chapel, and that w it was also a good experience. But most of the time, we were just here praying. Um, and the, uh, the, we prayed at the tombs of the shepherds, Francisco in the right transept, and Jacinta and Sister Lucia in the left. Uh, Saint Jacinta. While we were there, we had the pleasure of meeting with the Vatican postulator, Sister Angela de Fatima Coelho, ASM, a religious sister and a medical doctor, who became the postulator extra urbem for Francisco and Jacinta in 2012. She told us that their processes were introduced by the Bishop of Liaria in 1952. But there was a long debate about whether a child's spirituality could reach a mature faith. Jacinta was nine and Francisco ten when they died in the flu epidemic of 1919. Up until then, only ch Christian children who were martyrs could be canonized. 
Finally, the Congregation for the Causes of the Saints issued a report on the aptitude of adolescents and children for the heroic exercise of virtues and martyrdom, which supported the canonization of children if they had reached the age of reason. So, in 1989, Pope John Paul II raised the two shepherds to venerable. And, a miracle having been accepted the year before, he beatified them in 2000, setting up the possibility of canonization. Pope Francis surprised everyone by accomplishing it there, in fact, on the anniversary of the first appearance of Mary, May 13th. Sister Angela is now moving forward with the cause of the third shepherd, Sister Lucia de Jesus dos Santos, who was 10 years old when Our Lady appeared, and who lived a long life, and therefore has had a great deal of writing and correspondence that needs to be studied. And Sister Angela explained that whole process. All of that takes place right there in the local area. It's the Diocese of the area. And um, she has to go through all of that correspondence and all the writings and so forth before it can be sent to Rome and things then can move ahead. So she said it's going to take a while. Fatima is one of the most significant of the Marian apparitions. Along with Lourdes and Guadalupe, it is honored with a feast day. I have taken the title of this talk from St. Pope John Paul II's words on the appearances of Fat Fatima in Crossing the Threshold of Hope. And we will consider this near the end of my talk. I thought it would be useful to explore images of transparency and light through several Fatima voices. We find them in the early apparitions in the voice of Sister Lucia and her writings in the miracle of the sun in several voices, and in the voice and actions of St. Pope John Paul II. At the request of her bishop, Sister Lucia has written down her memories. They appear in four mem separate memoirs, and they were requested at different times. She wrote the ones we will uh, be concerned with the second, third, and fourth between 1937 and 1941. And um, she records in detail the early apparitions, which not too many people know about, with three of her girlfriends, not Jacinta and Francisco. And then the apparitions with Francisco and Jacinta that were, you've probably heard of, that were of the angel. And her descriptions are very carefully delineated. She was a very smart woman, and so her memoirs are very literate. So I'm going to divide my talk into four areas. The early apparitions, then the appearances of Our Lady. I'm going to separate out the miracle of the sun, and then finally, um, St. John Paul II's words and experience. <clears throat> Sister Lucia tells us that she began taking clear care of the flock of sheep when she was seven in 1915. On her first day at midnight after lunch, she and three girlfriends began to pray the rosary. So they prayed the rosary before the appearances of Our Lady. And they saw, this is her, these are her words, a quote, a figure poised in the air above the trees. It looked like a statue made of snow, rendered almost transparent by the rays of the sun, end quote. And as they finished, quote, the figure disappeared, end quote. That's from her second memoir. She told her mother that, quote, it looked like a person wrapped up in a sheet. End quote. It happened again in the same place, and then again. No one believed the girls. Oh, 
we are seeing here is that God really prepares us for any unusual things that happen in our lives. I know that in my own life. And I'm sure that these are the early preparations for the shepherds um, so that they would be able to handle what happened later on. Uh, Sister Lucia tells us in her memoirs that she sometimes would see little wisps of smoke um, just off beyond in the trees and so but and and they would go away and there be and they she wondered about them but it was God's way of making her pay attention the beginning was wisps of smoke and then there was this figure that the, she saw with her friends she mentions the names of her friend in the book okay the angel appearances to the three of them began in 1916, and I'm going to read a little bit of them. Lucia, she was then, joined her cousins to pasture the pasture this sheep that year. Now she's really pasturing sheep, and she had kind of had to argue to do that because she was young for it, for that. As the same, she had to argue her way into getting Holy Communion earlier than others did too. On three occasions, an angel appeared to her and Francisco and Jacinto. Uh, she uh, uh, gives accounts of these appearances in her second memoir and her fourth memoir. Uh, the first appearance, he came and identified him as the Angel of Peace. And Sister Lucia recalls, I can find the right spot here, one day, one fine day, we set out with our sheep for some land that my parents owned, which lay at the foot of the eastern slope of the hill that I have already mentioned. This property was called Cusa Vela. Soon after our arrival, about mid-morning, a fine drizzle began to fall, so fine that it seemed like mist. We went up the hillside, followed by our flocks, looking for an overhanging boulder where we could take shelter. Thus it was for the first time that we entered this blessed hollow among the rocks. It stood in the middle of an olive grove belonging to my godfather, Anastasio. From there, you could see the little village where I was born. I went there. My parents' home and the hamlets of Casavella and Era de Pedra. The olive grove, owned by several people, extended to within the confines of the hamlets themselves. We spent the day there among the rocks, in spite of the fact that the rain was over and the sun was shining bright and clear. We ate our lunch and said our rosary. I'm not sure whether we said it that day in the way I have already described to your excellency, she's writing because the bishop asked her to, saying just the word Hail Mary and Our Father on each bead. So great was our eagerness to get to our play. Our prayer finished, we started to play pebbles. I have to explain because this is in an earlier memoir. What they used to do when they really wanted to play, they didn't say the prayers. They would say, Our Father, Hail Mary, Hail Mary, Hail Mary, Hail Mary, Hail Mary, Hail Mary. Hail Mary, Hail Mary. <laughs> and they would do the whole rosary that way. <laughs> They're little kids, right? <laughs> All right? No surprise. We had enjoyed the game for a few moments only when a strong wind began to shake the trees. Now you can see what I meant when I said she's very literate and writes very well. We looked up, startled, to see what was happening, for the day was unusually calm. Then we saw coming towards us, above the olive trees, the figure I have already spoken about with the other girls. Jacinta and Francisco had never seen it before, nor had I ever mentioned it to them. As it drew closer, we were able to distinguish the features, distinguish its features, and I need to do something here, because this is my photograph of the um, uh, sculpture, the statue that they have there to commemorate this. It was a young man, about 14 or 15 years old, whiter than snow, transparent as crystal when the sun shines through it, and of great beauty. On reaching us, he said, do not be afraid. 
I am the angel of peace. Pray with me. Kneeling on the ground, he bowed down until his forehead touched the ground and made us repeat these words three times. My God, I believe, I adore, I hope, and I love you. I ask pardon of you for those who do not believe, do not adore, do not hope, and do not love you. It's a little, a little prayer for little people. Then rising, he said, pray thus. The hearts of Jesus and Mary are attentive to the voice of your supplications. His words engrave themselves so deeply on our minds that we could never forget them. From then on, we used to spend long periods of time, prostrate like the angel, repeating his words until sometimes we fell exhausted. I warned my companions right away that this must be kept secret, and thank God they did what I wanted. Now the reason that she wanted to keep it secret was because she had already had the experience of trying to tell people about the, what they had seen with her other two friends and nobody believed them. And so she knew it wouldn't be well received. So that's the first, the angel of peace. And then there's the second, again in Sister Lucia's voice. Some time passed, and summer came, when we had to go home for siesta. One day we were playing on the stone slabs of the well, of the well down at the bottom of the garden belonging to my parents, and I was there too, which we call the Añero. Suddenly we saw beside us the same figure, or rather angel, as it seemed to me. What are you doing, he asked. Pray, pray very much. They were playing games again. <laughs> the most holy hearts of Jesus and Mary have designs of mercy on you. Offer prayers and sacrifices constantly to the Most High. How are we to make sacrifices, I asked. Make of everything you can a sacrifice and offer it to God as an act of reparation for the sins by which he is offended and in supplication for the conversion of sinners. You will thus draw down peace upon your country. I am its angel guardian, the angel of Portugal. Above all, accept and bear with submission the suffering which the Lord will send you. So that was the second angel appearance. And then a third. A considerable time had elapsed when one day we went to pasture our sheep on a properly b property belonging to my parents, which lay on the slope of the hill I have mentioned, a little higher up than Valinos. It is an olive grove called Pradiera. After our lunch, we decided to go and pray in the hollow among the rocks on the opposite side of the hill. To get there, we went around the slope and had to climb over some rocks above the Pradiera. The sheep could only scramble over these rocks with great difficulty. As soon as we arrived there, we knelt down with our foreheads touching the ground and began to repeat the prayer of the angel. My God, I believe, I adore, I hope, and I love you. I don't know how many times we had repeated this prayer when an extraordinary light shone upon us. We sprang up to see what was happening and beheld the angel. He was holding a chalice in his left hand with a host suspended above it from which some drops of blood fell into the chalice. Leaving the chalice suspended in the air, the angel knelt down beside us and made us repeat three times, Most Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I adore you profoundly, and I offer you the most precious body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, present in all the tabernacles of the world, in reparation for the outrages, sacrileges, and indifference with which he himself is offended, and through the infinite merits of his most sacred heart and the immaculate heart of Mary, I beg of you the conversion of poor sinners. Then, rising, he took the chalice and the host in his hands. He gave the sacred host to me. She had made her first communion. 
and shed the blood from the chalice between Jacinta and Francisco. It was their first communion. Saying as he did so, take and drink the body and blood of Jesus Christ, horribly outraged by ungrateful men. Make reparation for their crimes and console your God. Once again, he prostrated on the ground and repeated with us three times more the same prayer, Most Holy Trinity, and then disappeared. We remained a long time in this position, repeating the same words over and over again. When at last we stood up, we noticed that it was already dark and therefore time to return home. These are quite remarkable. And she explains them beautifully. There's a slight difference between the first account and the second account, and it has to do with her own maturity of language. And she was able to use bigger words to explain <laughs> things when she was much older and, and uh, a good writer. <laughs> um, I'm going to leave this here for a minute as a moment of reflection before I ask you a few questions, and we'll have a little discussion. a good poem for reflection for a moment. Um, not only the wisp of smoke, but also the promise. Because I think that these angel appearances were the promise that was given to these young shepherds of what was coming ahead. They didn't know it, right? But it was. So I want to ask you, first of all, what do you make of these appearances? Were the children ever frightened? I think if this had happened to me, I'd have been scared to they death. They were not frightened of this part. Later on with Mary in the, in the um, June apparition, I believe it is, they were. But they were not here. The angel must have prepared them, uh, handled them very well and gently because there's no evidence in either of her accounts that they were in any way frightened by, by him. I say him, but <laughs> it's hard to know. <laughs> yeah. And what about the first appearance of the angel when she was with her girlfriends? Was mm -hmm. they never said anything? They, they did. They all talked about it. Nobody believed them. Okay. They so. reported it to their families, but nobody believed them. Mm -hmm. And why would they? You know, I mean, yeah. imagine your children going and telling you something like that. Would you? You know, it's not surprising they were skeptical. They thought children were just making up stories. Mm -hmm. So did the did the did the two um, Francisco and Jacinta? Yes, they received their first holy communion from the angel. Yes, they just took it under the blood, or did they That's take right. it under? They didn't take the host. No, not as she reports it. No, no. I'm interested in. Um, um, transparency and light, and we see that, don't we? Uh, tra trans transparent comes from trans in Latin, meaning across, as probably you all know, and from a pario parare, which means appear, right? So, um, and you could probably define it for me. What does transparent mean? You can see through it. It's mm -hmm. it's. it's Right, it's a substance that has the property of being having things rays and a blight or whatever go through it, um, and and things can be seen through it. Right, mm -hmm. um, a synonym would be, synonym would be diaphanous. Is mm -hmm. a, um, word, um, but notice already what we're getting in those terms. Um, the first angel to Lucia and her girlfriends, she describes as snow, so we have a whiteness there. Um, and then the angel of peace 
uh, almost transparent by the rays of the sun. The angel of peace was described as whiter than snow, transparent as crystal when the sun shines through it, and of great beauty. And the fourth, um, and the, uh, I wrote down fourth, third angel had an extraordinary light. No, oh, I did not, that's a mistake. <clears throat> Um, but all of them, it's light and transparency that's the dominant descriptor that she's using there. So what do you think is the purpose of transparency and light, at least at this stage with these early apparitions? What are some things that you can think of that are transparent? Brings out curiosity. Mm -hmm. That word gets used a lot in this day and age, and you think of nothing hidden. Good. Right. right. We use it metaphorically that way, don't we? Yes. He, he was very transparent, means he told you everything. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> what are some things that are transparent um, in terms of the earth, the elements, both air and water are transparent, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, our eye is transparent. Sometimes clouds and mists that are related to air and water. Um, windows are transparent. Saran wrap. <laughs> a lot of man-made things <laughs> right, are transparent. One of the things that I like to think of that's transparent are insect wings. Because they're very beautifully transparent. Um, anything made of glass, but stained glass windows are almost not transparent. You know, yeah. they're really right on the edge there. Sheer fabrics, a beautiful ball gown can be very, very sheer and transparent. Right, so it's, it, we think of transparent mostly as in beauty. Uh, too many ways we think of transparent negatively, although you'll see one later on. Um, so, what qualities do we attribute to transparent things? Seeing clearly. Clarity, right? Seeing clearly. And, and beauty. Beauty. Lightness, right? Things that are up in the air. Airiness. Can you see the light and transparency as preparation for the shepherds? I was thinking of curiosity. Mm -hmm. Yep. Because they had their first apparitions, they weren't afraid when the Blessed Mother appeared to them because they had already had the angel who was transparent and white and light. And when Our Lady appeared to them, she appeared as light. And she probably you know, she was very, probably, all these three, um, light, transparent, and, and probably very, very glowing white. At least that's what I would envision. I think you're right on there. I think that, yeah, each one of these, first with the wisps of smoke, and then the brief appearance with the girlfriends, and now quite significant appearance. I mean, with the chalice hanging in the air, that third appearance of the angel, it, it takes your breath away. Um, so it's very significant, not, can't match Our Lady, but it's very significant. You can see that the, as you say, the preparation is getting there. And a lot of it is white light and transparency, if you have to characterize it. And he did say, do not be afraid, I'm the angel of peace. So that was part of the preparation. Thank you. And who else said that all the time? Jesus. Jesus, many times. Many, many times. That's right. Thank you. Thank you for that in. So let's move on to the appearances of Mary. Mary appeared to the shepherds at the Covra de area on the 13th of May, 1917, until the 13th of October, except August, when they had been arrested. And then it was the 19th. World War I was raging, Lucia was 10, Francisco 9, and Jacintus just 7. 
Francisco was unable to hear any of the sounds. He could not hear Mary's voice. Um, but he saw her, and his observations are significant. Um, the two girls told him later on what she had said. Why, could he cannot, why, why couldn't he hear her? <laughs> it wasn't given to him to hear. And maybe because it sharpened his perception for what he saw. Okay. We'll see. We begin with in Lucia's voice. And we began to go down the slope. I'm, not, I'm cutting out a lot of preparation here, but because of time. Hurrying the sheep um, towards the road. When we were more or less halfway down the slope and almost level with a large home oak tree that stood there, we saw another flash of lightning. She had said that they, there was some lightning and they started moving because they thought there was going to be a storm. It wasn't. In fact, she says later on in the fourth memoir, the flashes of lightning were not really lightning, but the reflected rays of a light which was approaching. And they, they learned that after a while. We had only gone a few steps when there before us on a small home oak, we beheld a lady all dressed in white. She was more brilliant than the sun and radiated a light more clear and intense than a crystal glass filled with sparkling water when the rays of the burning sun shine through it. We stopped astounded before the apparition. We were so close that we were bathed in the light which surrounded her, or rather, which radiated from her. This is from the fourth memo. And Mary's voice through Sister Lucia. Do not be afraid. <laughs> she tells them that she is from heaven. Are you willing to offer yourselves to God to bear all the sufferings he will send you as an act of reparation for the sins by which he is offended and of supplication for the conversion of sinners? And the children's voice, yes, we are willing. After telling them to come on the 13th of each month, Mary told them that they would go to heaven, because they asked. Our Lady opened her hands for the first time, communicating to us a light so intense that, as it streamed from her hands, its rays penetrated our hearts and the innermost depths of our souls, making us see ourselves in God, who was that light, more clearly than we see ourselves in the best of mirrors." End quote. The children remain kneeling in the light. And Mary's voice again. Say the rosary every day to bring peace to the world and an end to the war. End of quote. Lucia's voice. Then she began to rise serenely going up towards the east until she disappeared in the immensity of space. The light that surrounded her seemed to open up a path before her in the firmament. And for this reason, we sometimes said that we saw heaven opening. However, with regard to the light communicated to us when Our Lady opened her hands and everything connected with this light, we experienced a kind of inner impulse that compelled us to keep silent. So that was their first encounter, the first vision of Mary. June 13th. This is the festa of St. Anthony of Lisbon. You know him as St. Anthony of Padua. And Franciscans all think of him as St. Anthony of Padua. But I can tell you, having been to Portugal, no one in Portugal thinks he's St. Anthony of Padua. He's St. <laughs> Anthony of Lisbon. And what you're looking at there is a photograph that we, of the 11th century church of St. Anthony of Lisbon. It's high on a hill, and right behind it, which you can't see, is the Cathedral of Lisbon. And it has in it a 13th century baptistry where St. Anthony was baptized. He was Fernando Martins de Bolloz, or de Bolloz, I'm not quite sure how you say that. Um, <clears throat> so, the parents of the shepherds thought they would all go to the festa. It was a big festa in Portugal. Everybody went, the whole town. And it was 
uh, held just outside of the town, so they left their homes. And they thought they would go, but they did not. Okay. With an, this is Sister Lucia. Um, that, and, and not only that, a number of people had arrived. They had heard about the first appearance. Not a great number, but others. With a number of people who were present, we saw once more the flash reflecting the light, which was approaching. The next moment, Our Lady was there on the homework, exactly the same as in May. Mary's voice. Are you suffering a great deal, she says to Lucia, and there's a reason for this, because um, after the first apparition, nobody, um, nobody, Sister Lucia, Lucia was not believed. Francisco and Jacinta were believed by their parents all the way through this, all through all the apparitions they supported their children and believed them. What was ironic was that Lucia's mother had taught her very, very firmly, and, and Lu Sister Lucia in her book repeats over and over again that she had been taught never to lie. And it was so ingrained in her mother, and her mother thought she was lying. And as a result, she was mean to her. She thought she was disciplining her child. And, and in fact, she had, in between May 13th and June 13th, she had forced her to go into the, where the priest's house was in their little, next to their local parish. I was also there. And um, uh, she told her to go in and tell that you made it, we're making up a lie. And Lucia said to her, I can't do that. I can't do that. You told me never to lie. I, can't, I would be lying. You know, basically that's what she said. And, um, and, her, and the priest didn't believe her either. He, when she came in and she said, I've been told to come, and you know, and the priest thought she was lying too, although he didn't accuse her of lying, but he, he, he didn't think she, and both of them uh, invoked the devils of people who lie, so she started to get quite scared. Um, so um, our late, Blessed Mother knew this, that that's why she asked her, are you suffering a great deal? Uh, Lucia's voice. As Our Lady spoke these last words, she opened her hands, and for the second time she communicated to us the rays of that same intense light that penetrated to our inmost hearts. That's in the third memoir. And then we hear Francisco's voice through Lucia's writing, because he didn't hear her. And he said, why did Our Lady have a heart in her hand? spreading out over the world that great light which is God. You were with Our Lady in the light which went down towards the earth, and Jacinta was with me in the light which rose towards heaven. And ultimately that is what happened. The two of them died and the chair lasted 90, 90 something she was when she died. Then we have July 13th. Um, on July 13th, there were more people. It's getting to be known all around the local area. Lucia was afraid to go when she saw the crowds of people, and she was wrestling with whether this is of the devil or not. She was really afraid to go, and it was Jacinta who talked her into going, because Jacinta said, Our Lady told us to come, and we're coming. This little seven-year-old twerp, right? <laughs> It was just, she was, she, actually, if you read the memoirs, and Lucia is very generous, Sister Lucia is very generous in her writing, it is Jacinta who is the holiest of all of them, the littlest one. Our Lady reveals the secrets and to sacrifice for sinners in July. And her, uh, Lucia's mother tells, takes, a, takes her to the priest again. Now this time the priest says, I don't know what to make of this. He backs off a bit of his... Uh, initial response to her. And she, they are, um, both, all three of them are interrogated by the administrator of the uh, area that they live in, which is Orem. I went to Santa Orem, which is the next, the biggest, the nearest big city. And um, that administrator said that he was going to keep interrogating her, um, and she says, even if it meant that he had to take my life. That's, they were threatened with that, with death, actually. And part of the reason for this was 
um, not only is World War I raging, but within Portugal, there's a political struggle raging. The monarchy had been overthrown not too long before then, and a Republican government put in. But the monarchists, those who wanted to bring back the monarchy, were still struggling against the Republicans, who were being tainted by communism. And so the administrator and the people think that this is an effort by some of the people um, in, in Aljustrel, the area where she, her little town, uh, to support the monarchists. So they're afraid of that. They think that the people, it's going to make the people rise up against the Republican government. So there's a political thing going on here that has nothing to do with what's going on, but that's what they thought. Her mother beat her. She talks about that. She defends her mother a lot in the book and because she feels sorry for her in her older years. She sees she really thought they were lying. <laughs> and there's another problem. The whole, uh, the, oh, their family won't talk to them and some of the people in the neighborhood because the area of the Covarda area was where they planted their vegetables. And all these people that are coming now have taken the vegetables and trampled the plants. And they, they live on this. And they, so they're really being harmed in what they can eat. So that's making the people also not like what the children are saying. And they are told the first secret, which is a vision of hell. Our Lady showed us a great sea of fire, which seemed to be under the earth. Plunged in this fire were demons and souls in human form, like transparent burning embers, all blackened or burnished bronze, floating about in the conflagration, now raised into the air by the flames that issued from within themselves, together with great clouds of smoke, now following back on every side like sparks and huge fires, without weight or equilibrium, amid shrieks and groans of pain and despair, which horrified us and made us tremble with fear, the demons could be distinguished by their terrifying and repellent likeness to frightful and unknown animals, black and transparent. This vision lasted but an instant. Mm -hmm. You can understand how they were, they were frightened. And she writes about the, the younger ones were very frightened for a while. They couldn't have trouble sleeping. Mary told them that they had seen hell, that they should establish a devotion to her immaculate heart, that there would be another war, signaled by an unknown light, and that actually did occur on January 28, 1938. Here's Lucia's voice again. After the two parts, which I have already explained, at the left of Our Lady and a little above, we saw an angel with a flaming sword in his left hand, flashing. It gave out flames that looked as though they would set the world on fire, but they died out in contact with the splendor that Our Lady radiated towards him from her right hand. Pointing to the earth with his right hand, the angel cried out in a loud voice, Penance, penance, penance. And we saw in an immense light that is God, something smaller to how people appear in a mirror when they pass in front of it, a bishop dressed in white. We had the impression that it was the Holy Father. And the second secret, of course, um, that they saw a train of bishops and the Holy Father killed. And the third secret, of course, is that the wars would end. Mary, to prevent this, I shall come to ask for the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart and the communion of reparation on the first Saturdays. If my requests are heeded, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. In the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. And she promised that Portugal would be preserved. It's Francisco's voice through Lucia. Um, she said that what wholly, what wholly absorbed him, Francisco, was not hell, but it was God, the most holy trinity, perceived in that light which penetrated our inmost souls. Afterwards, he said, we were on fire in that light which is God, and yet we were not burnt. Lucia, what is God? We could never put it into words. August 13th, the administrator and Orem um, questioned the children. Actually, they, a, 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 commun, a man with communist uh, activities in his record tricked them into getting into his car, saying that he was taking them to the local parish priest who wanted to see them, and he drove them to Orem and um, to the administrator. Um, 
and they were imprisoned for two days. However, and, and Jacinta particularly was worried that all the people would come, and they did. Dozens of people came, and they would be there on the, on the uh, 13th. Um, but a light appeared at the Goma. And instead, on August 19th, when they were with the sheep at Valinos, uh, as Lucia and Francisco waited, they saw the characteristic light, and they knew our lady was going to come, and, and Jacinta wasn't with them. So Lucia um, asked um, Francisco's brother John to run and get Jacinta, and he wouldn't go. <laughs> and she finally bribed him with a coin. <laughs> and just as Jacinta arrived, Our Lady appeared. Uh, the, Our Blessed Mother urged mortification, and she told them to come next month and to pray the rosary and to make what they call ardors which were um, little like litters, one for the boys to carry and one for the girls to carry. And then in September, by September, there were 30,000 people showing up at the Cobra on the 13th of September. And we saw a flash of light and Our Lady, and um, this one is more simple, they were told to pray the rosary and then she predicted the visions that would occur um, in October. <coughs> So, oh, a little reflection by a famous author, George Eliot. Some of you know her as Marian <coughs> Evans. So in all the appearances, we have the flash of lightning beginning at each one, coming to, as an announcing. And a, like a crystal glass full of sparkling water is similar to how she described the angel. Um, and the light that encircled Mary, the shepherds themselves were bathed in a heavenly light that penetrated into their souls. And interestingly, they see, we see ourselves in God. And in July, the, what's fascinating is the souls in hell were like transparent burning embers. Did you notice that? And demons were transparent. And war would be signaled by a strange unknown light. And again, they saw an immense light that is God. And the bishop was dressed in white. Those are all those kind of images. So what do you make of transparency and light in Mary, Mary's appearance now? I think Mary's appearance was just trying to tell us to, to come back and number one to her son, Christ, but also, um, you know, to her to say the rosary and to pray for the salvation of these people that are here on this earth. The, the people that are lost and the conversion of Russia hasn't really taken place, has it? You know, and the people that came, did they see the, the light or not? Did they see the flash of light or not? So did that make them believe? We don't have records of the people that came to these early ones, but we do have a record. That's why I'm separating off the, the October, because we have a record of that. Okay. to me that the flash or lightning or whatever they call it um, is a signal that a heavenly being is arriving. 
quite clearly, it, you know, um, that is, um, it's really also, I mean, it's a tearing apart or an opening of, our, of the dimension of our world okay. to let another dimension in. So it's really quite interesting. There's also, to go back to your thought about transparency being the idea of a thought being transparent or um, the way we use it today, um, there's the transparent clarity of Mary's requests. They are very clear. I mean, there's no doubt what she's saying, as you're pointing out. <laughs> I, I just had a thought here, you know, the, the flash of light. It, it would be like, you know, making, like the queen, when the royal when royalty comes, there's trumpets and everything mm -hmm. else. Mary, That's the good. Queen of Heaven, comes, mm -hmm. and there's this flash of lightning, you know, saying, "Hey, you know, something. The Queen of Heaven is coming." Yes. That's good. You I like know. That. I like that. Yeah. I I'm intrigued. The thing that intrigues me most about all of the descriptions of light and transparency in all of these appearances is that the children identify light with God. Yeah. It's in God. And very clearly, and it's both Lucia and Francisco are saying it. Mm -hmm. um, but, and also that even in hell, there's transparency in the souls, and of course they are, they were made by God. Mm -hmm. They may be in hell, but their soul is transparent. Mm -hmm. And um, even the demons, we know the fallen angels, right? which may give us a clue as to why hell is hell, if that goodness is still there, yeah, you know? That, that ability to change, to change your mind, mm -hmm. to decide to go from darkness to light. Mm -hmm. And they can't get there. And they can't get there. That's really of great interest. Both of those are of great interest, I think. Okay, I can see by the clock that it's time to take a break. And so we'll take a 10 minute break. Okay, thank you.
are we doing on time? Should I go? Okay. Um, so we want to talk about the miracle of the sun and um, the um, October 13th. We're, and as you can see, we're going to talk about it in three uh, voices. Uh, the final appearance of Mary occurred at noon, and it really was the zenith of the sun. Um, and the morning had been very rainy, but the sun burst through the clouds and, as we all know, danced, because that's what some of the reporters described it as. Um, there are various reports on how many people were present. Most of them say 60 to 70,000. Uh, one newspaper report went up to 100,000, but I've looked at the pictures, and the most responsible um, uh, witnesses seem to say 60 to 70,000 people were there. Mary identified herself as the Lady of the Rosary, and she directed the building of a chapel, which they did. Um, and these are, this is Mary's voice. Do not offend the Lord our God any longer. He is already so much offended. There were actually two apparitions in October, okay? The children saw one, and the people saw another. Um, the people saw the sun spinning and moving toward them, and I'll have a description of that in a minute. But the children saw a series of tableaux. That first they saw St. Joseph with Jesus and Mary seeming to bless the world. That was followed by Our Lord and Our Lady of Sorrows. Then Our Lady of Mount Carmel. And Sister Lucia would continue to see Our Lady in subsequent um, apparitions even at, long after Fatima when she was first she was with the Dorothean nuns and then she transferred to the Carmelites and when Our Lady appeared in those days she just urged Lucia to dedicate herself wholly to God here is Lucia's voice then opening her hand she made them reflect on the Sun and as she ascended the reflection of her own light continue to be projected on the sun itself. Um, there uh, were interviewed 30 to 40, I didn't count them all, but I read them, witnesses in a book called Meet the Witnesses of the Miracle of the Sun by John Hafford. Um, and we know that among the people there, there were many reporters that was reported in the uh, Portuguese newspapers, and several of those newspapers were skeptical newspapers, um, one of them of communist influence, and they did report it. Um, so, I mean, the, that probably is the most compelling <laughs> argument for it. Um, there was a reporter from the New York Times sent there to debunk it, who ended up writing a wonderful report of it. A professor of natural sciences from the University of Coimbra was one of the witnesses. Uh, he writes a, a beautiful, I, it, we don't have time, I had written them all down and I realized I don't have time to do all these, so I took them out. But, and many ordinary people. Um, I am going to read to you the witness, uh, this was a televised interview done in 1960 with Dominic Reese. Who I, I, I chose him as just a representative of the ordinary people of Portugal and what they said they saw. The sun started to roll from one place to another place and change blue, yellow, all colors. Then we see the sun come toward the children, toward the tree. Everybody was hollering out. Some start to confess their sins because there were no priests around there. And the people started to confess their sins out loud before everyone. That's right. Even my mother grabbed me to her and started to cry, saying, it is the end of the world. And we see the sun come right into the trees. And then the little children get up and turn around to the people and told the people, pray and pray hard because everything is going to be all right. And then the children walk to the tree and talk in the direction of the tree. And we see the children bend down just like bow to somebody. I don't see what. But something was there because we see the children bent down, bend down. Then we see the children move the lips to talk to someone. And an interviewer said, did you look at the sun without difficulty? Yes, I could look at the sun without pain in the eyes. 
Everyone around me was making a tremendous noise. Because of all the noise, I was looking at the crowd as the sun was actually falling. A afterwards, I was told that it had turned upon itself and fallen down. But at that moment, I saw it on my shoulder. Now, that's quite a compelling description. Um, all of them said that the sun moved, that, that they were enveloped in colors, that the sun turned colors, and that it fell. Some people described it, the movement as dancing. Some people described it as different ways. But all those three things, and everybody saw that. All these 30 or 40 witnesses that were interviewed. Now, you can't get 30 or 40 people in a room to tell the same story <laughs> like that. I mean, there's no way. So, um, so um, but I like Dominic's one. I, there was something very, very ordinary and truthful about it. Okay. I'm going to give you a little reflection from Gregory of Agrigentum, who was a bishop, 6th century bishop, and he's writing about the sun as a, and what it means. sees the sun as the sun of justice. And where in scripture do we see something like that? Is it in the prophecies, Isaiah maybe? Well, I was actually thinking the New Testament. Oh, you were thinking the New Testament. Revelations. Now we do. And, but even more, in Christ, and Mount Mount Tabor, when he was all just so radiant, okay, that's the transfiguration, right? And um, Ted was saying during the break, and not all of you heard it, but he was talking about um, Einstein's E equals MC squared, and he said that, well, light um, is a form of energy, and it converts to matter, and matter back to energy, to light. Um, and he was saying that the flashes of light before the divine beings come were the transference of the energy into matter. Mm -hmm. Wonderful insight, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And then light again when they leave, mm -hmm. converting back again. I think that's very beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very truthful, bringing, you know, science is always compatible with our religion in spite of what a lot of people think. Um, and so, so um, what this made me think of was, um, it, it's analogous to what happened to Christ on Mount, on Mount Tabor, similarly. So you'll see you have paper in front of you and a pen. <laughs> I have a little assignment for you. Okay? I would like you to write your response. And you get a, a two as if you had been there on October the 13th. Imagine yourself there, because I just sort of played it for you, right? And you get a choice. You get to be the New York Times reporter, and I'm going to ask you to write the headlines <laughs> that you would have put in New York. Or you can choose to be Dominic Reese, an ordinary person, and write a journal entry. Okay. I'll give you a few minutes to do that.
one more minute. Most people are finished. But you know you can buy them in the United States, I think. I think it's not very much. Um, and I, I, I sometimes will assist them with cheese. You know, like that. It's edited by Spago Lewis Condor. He was the uh, postulator. So the sister that I showed you was his assistant until he died. And she became a postulator. And he was the postulator. So Looks like it's the fun for Francisco and Justina Maya the publisher. That's what it looks like. Okay. Um, who became the New, New York Times reporter? Only one New York Times reporter. I used to be a reporter in a previous oh, good. life. Uh, <laughs> are you brave enough to share what you wrote? Okay. <laughs> I haven't been a reporter in a while, so this is going to sound rough. Uh, the headline I wrote was, Sun dances in the sky, all are odd. Hoba de Ira, Portugal. A, record no a crowd numbering 30 to 40,000 gathered here today, along with three small children, Lucia, Francisco and Jacinta for what allegedly is an appearance by the Blessed Mother of God. <laughs> we got the point of view. <laughs> the children bowed low and appeared to be conversing with someone. The altos also stare at the, stared at the sky awed, seeing something the crowd could not see. Suddenly the sun broke through the clouds, whirling and shooting off colors of red, blue, and gold. Everyone was enveloped in this light. Many fell to their knees in prayer. The sun began to move closer to the earth, moving side to side and whirling. It appeared to be coming toward the earth. People were tearful, were terrified. Shouts of the end of the world were heard. And, the sun, and then the sun returned to its place in the sky. It shone normally, and all became quiet. Very nice. Thank you very much. Very nice. So a lot of you did private journals, huh? <laughs> Anyone want to share your very private journal? I was uh, thinking of Dominic, and I said, I would ask uh, Adonai uh, to show me uh, the conception of the Lady of Fatima so I would have a deeper understanding. Very nice. Very nice. Anybody else want to share one? I, 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 they, they were all dry afterwards. That's true. She, he, what he's pointing out is this is true. And many of the people reported that, that they had gotten soaking wet. And not only were they dry, but the whole ground was dry. Everything was as dry as could be from the heat of the sun, it had come so close. Mm -hmm. And also, I mean, that's another miracle that people could look at the sun and see it. See it really. but many of them said, like, you look at the moon, is the way they described it. Or they'd say it was defined, meaning it didn't have the rays that prevent us from seeing it and ruining our eyes. 
as we know from the eclipse. The <laughs> Do you know if any, if, if any scientific inquiry has been done with regard to the sun, to the, what is described that the sun did? You mean on the ground there? Well, I wonder if there's any, been any, you know, lots of times these things happen and people, uh, you know, try to look for maybe possibly some scientific reason, like, like the star, oh, the yes. Christmas star. You know, people are always, well, what was that? And, and I guess now they think it was a conjunction of three planets. It was very bright. And uh, that also occurred at about this time. And so they're thinking that the star that the Magi followed was actually this conjunction. And I wondered if anybody had they done have. anything with, um, with, with this situation. Yeah, they actually, ha there are quite a few books and one more re recent one, and I had that also. I was going to do a little bit with that, but I knew I would run out of time. Um, where the author is clearly trying to show that Fatima was not a miracle. And um, uh, there, there is something they call them sun dogs. And his, the argument is that these sun dogs, which appear so that you look like you're seeing three suns, a, a big one and smaller yeah, ones, a... um, that that's what that was. Um, and the, this particular book that I was looking at, the author um, basically is arguing that it was mass hysteria. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, you know, so there are those people that are try that try uh, are trying to show that it isn't, but um, most no no weight has been given to any of these people that try these. Well, the, years ago there was the TV show Unsolved Mysteries yes. with Robert Stack, uh -huh. and one of their one of the things they they covered was this um, miracle at Fatima, mm -hmm. and. And in talking about it, you know, they had they had talked to you know zillions of people who had seen something and they described what they saw, but there were also people who said, "I didn't see anything. It was just a, it was it had been a cloudy, rainy day, and suddenly the sun came up." And maybe they didn't. And that's all they saw. And I thought, well, you know, something in you has to be open to these things. Well, also and not in the state of grace. And, and not all, everybody's open. Well, if you're not in the state of grace, you very well might not have seen a miracle. Yeah. So, it, it, I mean, they may not have seen it. Yeah. So, I was yeah. surprised when I first heard about yeah. it, but I thought, well, it could be. You know, everybody's on mm -hmm. a different, that's right, a different level and open to different things. And so, sometimes you, you know, would see these and sometimes. Does anybody you else want to share before I go on with my presentation? Does anyone else want to share what you wrote? Would you mind putting your name on it and giving sharing it with me? I'd be interested in knowing what you wrote. I won't share it with anybody. If you can give it to me when at the end. Oh, uh, I didn't go there. This is uh, the bishop. He was uh, a sixth-century bishop of in Sicily. Uh, from that quotation, from that icon today, and I thought, oh, I want to add that. Okay. On May 13, 1981, our Holy Father John Paul II survived an attempt on his life in St. Peter's Square. He credited his survival to Our Lady of Fatima's protection and eventually brought the assassin's bullet to Fatima and placed it in her distinctive crown. It fit perfectly. This is our Holy Father at the time he was shot. And the bullet is right here in her crown. I saw it in the museum. And it fit perfectly right in the hollow in the center. It, they didn't have to do anything. It fit right in. And it can be seen today in the museum there. When we were there, a sister from Sri Lanka showed it to us. And the crown was made, this I love, from the jewelry of the women of Portugal because this is a poor country, even today. It certainly was a poor country then. And so I think it's very meaningful because the crown was made by the jewelry of the women. And so we have the voice of John Paul II from Crossing the Threshold of Hope. All the sacraments are an action of Christ, the action of a God in Christ. 
and therefore it is truly difficult to speak of the silence of God. One must speak rather of the desire to stifle the voice of God. Yes, this desire to stifle the voice of God is rather carefully planned. Many will do just about anything so that his voice cannot be heard, so that only the voice of a man will be heard, a voice that has nothing to offer except the things of this world. And sometimes such an offer brings with it destruction of cosmic proportions. Isn't this the tragic history of our century? And then he discusses communism. And after that discussion, and what are we to say of the three children from Fatima, who suddenly, on the eve of the outbreak of the October Revolution, heard, Russia will convert, and, in the end, my heart will triumph. They could not have invented those predictions. They did not know enough about history or geography, much less the social movements and ideological developments. And nevertheless, it happened just as they said. That was, excuse me, October of what year? Um, uh, the the day, October Revolution? Are you asking? Yeah, I'm asking you what, what, what year was it? What? 1917 was there, the no, apparition. No, about Pope. Oh, oh 1981. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't know you. And then he goes on. Perhaps this is also why the Pope was called from a faraway country. Perhaps this is why it was necessary for the assassination attempt to be made in St. Peter's Square precisely on May 13, 1981, the anniversary of the first apparition of Fatima, so that all could become more transparent and comprehensible so that the voice of God which speaks in human history through the signs of the times could be read, could be more easily heard and understood. This then is the Father who is always at work, and this is the Son who is also at work, and this is the invisible Holy Spirit who is love, and as love is ceaseless, creative, sanctified, and life-giving. And I wanted to, for a reflection, put this quotation. This is so typical of St. Jacinta Marta. She would say to her friends, So it seems clear from John Paul II that his view of Fatima has to do with things that are transparent. In this, how would you describe Mary as a facilitator of God's work? Well, just the fact of her appearing and willing to you know, say what is needed. We need to pray. Um, um, we need the rosary for the conversion of Russia. Uh, uh, she was the voice that was heard so that um, not only the children heard it, but then as the word spread, I think more and more people said and still say the rosary for peace. And listen to what you just said. Mary's voice, the voice that we only hear twice in Scripture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Any other thoughts? I didn't quite understand that last, what you were just talking about. I couldn't hear her. Oh, say it again louder. A little louder. Uh, she asked about Mary being the facilitator, and I said, just the fact that she was willing to appear to the children um, and voice what was needed in order to stop wars, to stop communism, pray the rosary, 
Okay, thank you. In a way, it's another fiat, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's what God needed. What is a fiat? Yes. Yes, yeah, saying yes. I will do it. Oh, okay. Thy will be done is how it's translated. Oh, okay. But yes. Um, in the book I referred to about the witnesses, John Haffert makes the analogy of a father who is upset about the misbehavior of his children and about ready to chastise them. But first he asks the mother to warn the children of his intention. And I thought that was a great analogy. <laughs> yes. Um, and we need to hear it. We need to hear um, in this centennial the same words over again because when you look at America today or the world today or me, myself, and I today, right? We, we need these words. But Fatima is interesting because of some of the things that were um, very unusual about it. One, it's the first time in history that God performed a miracle at a predicted time to, um, and place to prove something to us, to communicate something to us. Um, it also makes a claim that war is caused by sin. And it also shows that good people can obtain mercy. All of those are fascinating. So, we have listened to many voices of our Blessed Mother. This truly is incredible. As I was working on this more and more, I just was overwhelmed with the thought that she says so little in Scripture and she says so much at Fatima. Mm -hmm. That's incredible in itself. Um, of Sister Lucia, who was obviously, she says in her memoirs that um, she was gifted with a wonderful memory. And we know why, you know. And also the ability to write and to put everything into words. <clears throat> of the young saints, Francisco 